Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 30, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, The final budget passed Saturday night included an income tax. We discuss how much and who's paying it. Second, our view on where oil prices are headed and what that means both for the state's fiscal situation and North Slope oil development. Third, we take a stab at how we think the governor will handle the budget. Will there be vetoes? And if so, what type? And now, let's join Michael. Every week, Brad Keithley from Alaskan uh, for a sustainable budget come in and uh, he comes in and talks with us about what we call the weekly top three. The top three items that um, he believes and I believe are the most important things uh, that we should be focusing on. And of course, uh, the one thing that's threw my sleep pattern off more than anything else was the budget. And that's going to be Brad's number one this morning, that the budget and the income tax gimmick that they use to fund the budget. Brad, uh, good morning, my friend. What is this trick? So the way they the way they constructed the budget uh, this year was um, the traditional revenues, and then my view of of how they're doing the PO, the POMV draw or how they're breaking up the POMV draw. Uh, about a billion and a half in uh, in POMV funds, uh, POMV using POMV fifty fifty, um, and then some CBR draw. But a big chunk, about 20% of the uh, of the of the funds used to support the budget, are coming from uh, PFD cuts. Are coming from uh, uh, diversion of money otherwise statutorily headed for Alaskans' pocketbooks, headed for Alaskans' income, diverted that money to government, and that's that's the economic definition. Of an income tax, when you when you divert income that otherwise is in the private sector or headed for the private sector to government, that's an income tax. So about 20% of the uh, and and we need to call it that to to bring attention to what's going on here. About 20% of the budget is being funded by an income tax, an income tax uh, created through uh, PFD diversions, but a tax on income uh, nonetheless. And then when you step into it, so, so who's paying that income tax? And we did some numbers that, that I think um, people listening here and elsewhere will be interested in. We've got it up on our, on our Facebook page, the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page. We broke who's paying that income tax down by uh, income bracket. And, and as, we have been, as we've been saying all along, uh, it's largely middle and lower income Alaska families uh, that are paying that income tax. The, the effective tax rate, uh, when you view PFD cuts as an income tax, the effective tax rate, the amount by which the income of these of uh, the income brackets have been reduced, um, the income tax rate for the low 20 percent, the lowest 20 percent uh, by income is 22.4 more than more than a fifth of their income is being taken away, diverted to government um, uh, as a result of the income tax passed by the legislature. The lower middle uh, income bracket, um, the next 20 percent, 10 percent. The effective tax income tax rate is 10 percent. 
the middle income Alaska family, and these are these are families. Uh, we did this on on families of the average Alaska family size, 2.81. Um, so this is 2.81 um, uh, uh, members of a family. The effective tax rate uh, of the of the income tax created by the the PFT cut um, for middle income Alaska families, a middle 20 percent, is 6.4 percent. For the upper middle income Alaska family, it's 3.8 percent. And then when you get to the top 20 percent, it's only the income tax rate is only 1.4 percent. We also in 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 the chart we did um, we we looked at what the tax rate would have been if we had done a flat tax or if you don't like the if you don't like the term flat tax we just looked at what the at what the tax rate would have been if we charged all Alaska families the same percent uh, of their of their income to pay this income tax and that's 3.5% the 3.5% tax on adjusted gross income would produce the same revenue as what they've done. So instead of the, instead of the 22.4% that the lowest 20% is paying or the 6.4% that the middle 20% is paying, if we had a flat tax or if you just look at it on the basis of what if all Alaskan all Alaska families paid the same, contributed the same, they're paying more um, uh, much more through the PFD diversion, the PFD tax, than they would pay through a flat tax. The only income group that is better off using PFD cuts than, than a flat tax is the top 20%. Put another way, the remaining 80% of Alaska families, the remaining 80% of Alaska families, if we're going to go down this road, the remaining 80% of Alaska families would be better off with a flat tax, uh, just paying the same rate as everybody else, uh, as opposed to the type of income tax that we've got right now. But the but the point, Michael, is we need to start looking at these PFD cuts as an income tax. People say, people in this state say, well, I don't want an income tax. Well, that's exactly what the PFD cut is. It is a diversion to government. Of revenue of, of dollars that otherwise are going to the private sector. Classic definition, economic definition of an income tax. And and we're paying it. And we need to understand that the legislature passed a budget that is 20% financed by that income tax. Right. If we're gonna go there, if we're gonna have an income tax, we need to be talking about a fairer way to do it than the continuation of of, of this approach, because this approach, as ICER's long told us, has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, and by far is the, is the most costly to Alaska families. We, if we're going to keep going down this road, and it looks like we are, if we're going to keep going down this road of plugging the budget with an income tax, we need to have a fairer income tax, a fairer way of doing it than the way we're doing it right now. Well, and we talk about, Brad Keithley's our guest, by the way, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We talk about, um, you know, the, the, the this income tax, and people immediately start frothing at the mouth. There was a post by Representative Bryce Edgman, the Speaker of the House, talking about what they did, kind of self-lauding and then chastising at the same point. You know, lauding themselves for how great they did, and then chastising Alaskans for basically being greedy and wanting to cut into the size of government. And then you got into a little bit of a tiff with one of the... Uh, uh, one of the commenters in there basically saying that, you know, she said, I haven't given up on on cutting the government like you have. Um, but, you know, it, it, to talk about a flat tax. And we've been talking about this for a while now uh, and people get really mad about it. But there just there is no there is no will. I mean, maybe now. I don't know. But there is no will for uh, jumping in on this and, and making it happen. We have to start talking about you know, if there's going to be a tax, and it looks like there is, and there is currently with the PFD tax, how, you know, how do you how do you address this with people? Well, Michael, it's the same way I did in that in that conversation. Basically, there there is there is no way we are. I mean, you just have to face reality at some point. There is no way we are cutting ourselves, uh, cutting spending to the level necessary to avoid some sort of revenue approach, some sort of tax approach. If you look at um, another chart we're going to have come up uh, later this morning on, on, on Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, if you look at where the budget is at $40, barrel, $40 a barrel 
and we'll talk about this in the second segment when we talk about oil prices, but I think it's a fair number to use. When you look at, at, at oil at, at $40 a barrel going forward, we are running huge deficits, uh, an average over the next 10 years of a billion, 600 million a year um, uh, above and beyond um, uh, uh, traditional revenues plus uh, POMV 5050. Um, and, and, for anybody, I mean, for anybody who lived last year through last year, and 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 understood what was going on, to think we're going to cut a billion six uh, out of the uh, out of the budget, twenty uh, percent of the budget, more than twenty percent of the budget, to think we're going to cut that out of the budget, is just, I mean, they're they're in some in some other land, and so if you if you accept the reality, we're not going to cut that amount out of the budget. It's got to be funded somehow. If we don't have alternative revenues, if we don't have other forms of new revenues, the legislature is just going to continue using PFD cuts. So if you're saying I'm not going to, I'm not going to support new revenues. I'm against, I'm, I'm against any sort of tax other than the PFD tax. I'm against any sort of tax. If you say that, what you are setting up is a situation in which every year when the legislature comes down to fund the budget they're going to they're going to cut the pfd and they're going to be cutting it to zero i mean if you look at the chart at 40 dollars a barrel there, there's no room anymore they're going to be cutting it to zero so opposing a new revenue option you've got to get it in your mind because it's accurate opposing any new revenues means that you're accepting uh deep and and indeed the elimination of the pfd uh, over the next 10 years. And and that's, I mean, well, that's the alternative. Well, I mean, 10 years, Brad, I'd be surprised, quite honestly, and we had a conversation with Ed King yesterday, and he said something similar. I think the PFD, as we know it right now, is dead. Uh, I mean, I think we would be surprised, and Edgman already said that in his piece yesterday. Uh, he said next session is going to be even worse than this session. If you thought this session was bad, next session is going to be even worse because they've kicked the can down the road and they've all realized they've run out of road. I don't know is we'll even get a PFD next year. Well, I mean, yeah, well, that I, I think that's accurate. When I use ten years, I'm just I, I do that because I get the average number. But it's but that's exactly right, Michael. I mean, it begins next year, it begins this year actually. I mean, if they if they hadn't rated the CBR one last time, um, uh, we would be at zero PFD this year uh, in order to fund the budget at forty dollars a barrel. There's just no other way. Um, uh, to, to fund, to realistically fund the budget other than some new revenue source. And if you oppose the other, all the other alternative new revenue sources, what you're saying is you're fine with a PFD cut. Matt has been asking some interesting questions and, um, and, and I want to, uh, I want to address these really quick, Brad, before we jump into the rest of the veto. Um, <clears throat> he said, uh, uh, if Keith Lee admits the PFD is gone, then why is he disingenuously arguing for an income tax in lieu of a PFD tax? To which I responded, I think his argument is that if there was another form of revenue in the form of a traditional tax, that it would replace the money taken by the PFD, ergo we would have a tax. Or we would have a PFD, rather. And he said, and yet he said, not only is the PFD gone, but they're coming for other sources of revenue. The only way anyone should agree to any tax is if there's some kind of guarantee that the PFD comes back. We all know that unless there are real cuts, deep cuts, the PFD is gone and they're going to tax the private economy into uh, oblivion. Um, what are your what are, what's your comment on that? Well, A, we don't know that. I mean, the, the proposal that, that some have put forward is to go to POMV 5050 uh, to lock that in. Uh, at POMV 5050 for the PFD, and then and then have revenues, uh, new revenues on top of that. If we do that, uh, you're not adding to revenues; you're replacing, uh, you're replacing uh, the revenues. And I think that's achievable. I think that would be achievable uh, with the legislature. So I, I think that's a that's a false premise. But the reason the reason that we're talking about taxes uh, in lieu of the PFD is there in, in lieu of PF, additional PFD cuts is because taxes are fair. I mean, again, one more time, cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy and on Alaska families of all the options. So if, if you want to cut PFDs, fine. But what you're doing is, 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 is choosing the, the option that has the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy and on Alaska families. Matt Johnson, I think, I think says he's pro-family, but he's choosing the option that has the largest adverse impact, impact on Alaska families. There are other options that have much lower impacts on the economy, or much more broad-based, much lower impacts on the economy, 
much more impacts on Alaska families. The choice is between do you want the worst or do you want something that is less, less worse? Um, and, and I think uh, as Alaskans, we ought to be choosing less worse. We ought not to be punishing Alaska families. We ought not to be opting for the worst impact on the overall Alaska economy. We ought to be looking for something more broad-based and that, that has a lower impact and is fairer, more equitable to Alaska families. How do you tell people, you know, because, again, a lot of people say, look, fiscal responsibility comes first before we start talking about taxes. Um, because, you know, you're talking about replacing the PFD take with this other income, but there's nothing to stop them from doing it on top of and making it more revenue overall and doing it. And I think that's most people's fears because that's been the reaction of this legislature in the past. We've got about less than a minute here. Well, I would condition personally, I've said all along, I would condition uh, uh, supplemental revenues on uh, alternative revenues on on firming up the PO, the PFD at POMV 5050. Uh, it's not, I'm not trying to add to uh, add to spending. Actually, I don't think the legislature would add to spending, uh, but I'm trying to, uh, this is, this is for me, this is all about replacement revenues as, a, as opposed to additional revenues. And the way you get there is to have a commitment on POMV 5050 uh, before you, before you pile any additional revenues on top of it. Um, I want to. I, I do want to move on. It. We, but I mean, I, I gotta see. You know, two things. First of all, I'd love for you to address Bryce Edgman's post on Facebook. Second of all, I'd love for you to address the method by which they got the budget passed, with this kind of uh, you know holding hostage the COVID funding, the threats against uh, you know serious road projects in the state of Alaska like the KGB road project, and the twisting of arms that they did in the minority to get all this stuff done. Uh, if you would comment on those two things, I'd love to hear it. Sure. So Bryce's post post is is stark, uh, upsetting, but accurate. Essentially, Bryce is saying uh, the, the PFD is dead. I mean, we're essentially Bryce is saying we're going to continue spending. We're going to continue spending at, at at current levels plus inflation, which is what everybody has said ought to be the spending cap. Um, we're going to continue spending. Uh, we're, we're without alternative revenues. The PFD is dead. I mean, it's it's a stark reading. It's upsetting to read it, but it's accurate. And 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 we need to instead of just you know sort of flailing around saying what a horrible person he is, we need to take to heart what he's saying and react to that. If you're fine with the with the elimination of the PFD, that's where we're going. If you don't want the elimination of the PFD, we need to be talking about alternative new revenues. Second, the, the the way in which the majority got the got the budget passed, that's what happens when you have a majority. I mean, yes, uh, Bert uh, uh, did some really screwy things with the with with how he how he juggled uh, the the funding sources in a way to put the minority in a very difficult position on the CBR draw. Uh, but that's what the majority can do. I mean, Bert's done this before. He did it to Parnell back in. 2010, I think, when Parnell was threatening to veto some stuff, Burt uh, juggled around the budget uh, in a way that, that basically Parnell couldn't do it. Um, and, and, and that's, I mean, that's what the majority can do. Instead of getting upset at, uh, at Burt's juggling and calling him all sorts of names, uh, we need to be upset that, that we don't have fiscal conservatives in the majority, and we need to work toward getting fiscal conservatives in the majority. Yeah, Bert, I, it was a it was a bad thing. It was it was it was very strategic and it was very manipulative what Bert did. But that's what the majority can do, and we need to understand. As long as we're not in the majority, as long as fiscal conservatives aren't in the majority, that's what's going to happen to us every time. I was beating the hell out of Bert Stedman yesterday. He deserved every minute of it. Uh, but I guess you can't, like you said, it, uh, you can't blame. He's not Tiger's not going to change his stripes. He's done it before. He'll do it again. This is the problem with the uh, binding caucus in the majority for the way it is right now. Am I wrong? No, it's. I mean, that, that, that's 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 right. The, a large part of the problem is the binding caucus. Uh, but he had he had the necessary votes. He had sixteen votes or fifteen votes, three quarter, fifteen votes. Um, uh, even without the binding caucus, I mean, if you would have let uh, uh, Shower and the others vote differently, he would have still had. Uh, 15. I, it's, I mean, and, 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 and people say, well, the, the legislature just should have rejected, you know, the conference committee report and sent it back and sent him to, and, and, and told him to do over. Well, Bert would have done it over. He would have put the entire PFD, uh, under the CBR. I mean, it was just a question of time 
until he cranked down the screw, found the, enough screws to crank down to get the vote he needed. Um, and 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 yes, one can be upset that that Bert has that talent, uh, if you can call it that. Uh, one can be uh, upset that he used that talent in this way, but that's what giving you, that's what the majority, uh, uh, enables you to do, uh, super majority, uh, enables you to do. Well, and I understand playing politics. Okay. I mean, I do understand playing politics, but the one, the, the two things that got me, the first thing was putting the, you know, putting the COVID response instead of put paying it first, instead of putting it at the top of the heap. And saying this is the most important thing. Alaskans are getting sick. Alaskans are dying. Everybody's in shutdown. The economy, blah 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 blah. Instead of all that, to contend to 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 hang the whole thing on that, to me, um, I mean, I use the word despicable, and I'll still continue to use the word despicable. I, I mean, politics is politics. You want to hang the PFD on it? Fine. That's just politics. It's nasty, but it is what it is. But to hang the, the, that funding, and then personally, on a personal level, when he walks around to legislators and say, oh, yeah, all those capital projects, like the road project for the Canicus Bay Road, the most dangerous road in America, uh, you know, oh, we're, we're just, you can forget that. We'll just kiss that one goodbye, too. I mean, you're putting, you're literally playing with people's lives. I mean, 10 people have died on the road that I live on in the five years that I've lived here. This thing is dangerous as hell. They've been saying that they're going to expand it. This is the year where the money was going to come out and do it. And now... Now he's threatening that. I mean, that, that's that's not just politics at that point. Yeah, but Michael, I, and I'm not defending Bert, but I'm just trying to explain Bert. I mean, on the other side, he's got people in, in the majority who are saying, in the majority, who are saying, you know, my project, my my spending uh, is is as important as all of those things. Do not put that at risk. Yeah, it would have been great if Bert would have said, okay, the thing we're going to subject to the CG, CBR vote is the university. And if you vote against the CBR, then you don't fund the university. That would have been wonderful. <laughs> that right, would have been right. That would have been perfect. But but he had people in the majority. I mean, and they are the majority. That's the thing we got to keep in mind. He had people in the majority saying, "Don't don't put the don't put the university at risk. Don't put this at risk. Don't put that at risk." And so yeah. what do you what you put at risk is is the stuff that's going to drag the 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 that thirtieth vote uh, across the line. That's the power that the minor that the majority has, um, and and as long as you can hold together your majority, uh, uh, that's the that's that's what you're able to do. I, it, it's bad. I mean, yes, it's manipulative. Yes, it is. It is uh, devilish. Uh, yes, it's worth all sorts of of bad words. But that's what the that's the power the majority has, and as long as fiscal conservatives uh, aren't in the majority, that's the result we're going to get. So the takeaway is that we should be changing the majority. I mean, that's what I mean. I think that's the long and the short of what you're trying to say here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That, that's what we've been saying for right. the eight years that we've been that we've been at this. Yes, as long as fiscal conservatives aren't in the majority, as long as we have, and 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 and, and it's not just that. As long as we have representatives who are going to say, "Well, my constituent wants the state arts council to be funded." Uh, as long as we have representatives who are going to go up and do that special pleading for their thing and say, exempt this from the budget, um, we're not going to get there. Everybody, everybody has got to be willing to put their pet project at risk uh, to, to some degree of cut uh, to, to, get the, to get the budget down. And right now we don't have, we don't have 16. I mean, we, we can go through this conversation again, but we don't have 16 who are willing to do that. One of the most interesting things about, you know, like I said, Bryce Edgman's uh, post up here on Facebook is the starkness of it. This is the first time that I think that he has said something along the lines of, the, you know, that next year we could easily feature all of the same time major budget cuts, attempts to impose revenue measures, and a zero PFD. I mean, this is pretty – this is it. I mean, this is where they're saying I think even they are starting to realize that they have run out of road to kick the can down. And, uh, I mean, I think this is it. 25 seconds. Michael, we only have $2.9 billion of traditional revenues plus POMB 50-50 uh, next year. $2.9 billion against a budget of $4.6 billion. There, we have hit the end of the road. We're into number two right now, and we're talking about oil prices. Uh, we had a little discussion about this yesterday. Brad was saying, you know, at $40 a barrel, it's going to be tough. We're, we're not even at $40 a barrel right now. And there's talk that the bottom could drop out of this thing. It could get into the single digits. Brad, what is the effect? Where is it going? What are your thoughts on this? 
Well, Michael, there's two things going on that are driving prices down. One is uh, the, the, the drop, the huge drop in demand. Some people are, are, or numbers are suggesting we've, we've lost a quarter of world demand for oil. Um, the huge drop in demand as a result of the uh, response to the virus. And, and that's going to continue for uh, an extended period of time. Uh, it, we, at some point, we'll be, we'll be past this virus, hopefully, uh, and the economy will restart. But it will, be, will, it will be a fairly slow restart as people sort of adjust to the new world that we've gotten to. Um, and it's not clear when we're even going to get to Yesterday, the governor of Virginia announced that their uh, uh, stay-at-home order will stay into effect, uh, stay in effect June tenth. Um, so it's not even clear when we when we get to that clear point. The economy will start to really, uh, respond uh, after that point, um, and demand will start picking back. If we've lost, it's going to be a while to to get that demand back. And th- so that's 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 phase. One, and we may be talking to the end of the of the year um, until we get through uh, until phase one. Uh, phase two uh, is being created by this price war between Saudi, uh, and and the and the glut of oil on the market. Even if we had even if we had all of the demand back right now, uh, this the price war and the and the production numbers that Saudi and Russia are putting up right now would drive price down um, anyway. And and it, 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 so that war will, if that war outlasts the end of the virus, that war will continue to depress, depress price. That's sort of phase two. Phase three is even when that war comes to an end, even when the price war comes to an end, and we may be talking a year or more, uh, before that happens, even when the price war comes to an end, we're going to have a huge overhang glut of oil um, in all sorts of places. It's going to be in all sorts of storage capacities. Um, and then what happened uh, in 2014 was we had a huge glut of oil sitting in what are called drilled but uncompleted wells, ducks, D-U-Cs, um, in, uh, in the shale regions. Uh, and what drilled and uncompleted wells are is you, you go ahead and drill the well because you've got a contract with the driller that you have an obligation to pay for. And so you have the driller go ahead and drill the well. But because of price, you don't complete the well. The well just sits there in an uncompleted status. And ducks, um, so, so when the price war is over and when oil prices are coming back up, then the first thing you do is go and complete the ducks uh, and bring that, bring that oil back on. You don't drill new wells. You uh, you bring that oil back on. You try to bring it on as fast as you can. And what that happened, what 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 that did, coming out of the 2014 crisis, was extend the price drop for about another year. Uh, as people brought their as as oil came out of storage, as people wanted to bring oil out of storage, um, and as you brought the ducks back online. So um, we're in this for for an extended period. Um, it's not clear what happens when we come out of phase three. Um, what kind of world we're going to be in, but we're we're going to be in these first, second, and third phases for an extended period. Right now, the futures market is telling us uh, that that we stay in the 30s. We we get to we get to the high 30s um, uh, after the first of the year, but we stay in the 30s throughout this year. Um, and the and the current average of the futures prices over next year is about 35 dollars. Once we get out of this at the end of, and, and, and by year, I mean fiscal year. Uh, next, we stay in, I'm thinking about Alaska fiscal year. We stay in the 30s through June, through July of next year. Once we get out of this, um, the 40s, we come into the 40s in, in the next fiscal year. Uh, but we stay in the 40s until the futures market is telling us until 2024. And then we cross back into the, into the, into the $50 range. So we're gonna we're gonna be in the 30s this year. Looks like we're gonna be in the 30s this fiscal year. We're gonna be maybe in the 40s if we're lucky in the next fiscal year. Uh, but we're gonna stay in the 40s for an extended period of time. And it could be, as as we've talked about before on the show, it could be that the new normal, instead of the 55 to 65 dollar range, is a 45, 40 to 50, 55 dollar range. Um, but that's I mean that's looking ahead several years. 30s this year, 40s next year. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. So what you're saying is if 
we get our ducks in a row, it extends the oil crisis. <laughs> Sorry, I just I couldn't help myself. Um, all right. <clears throat> so what does that spell for us, though? $30 a barrel next year, 40 potentially for the foreseeable future beyond that for at least a year or two beyond that. What does that mean for the state of Alaska revenue-wise, and, and you know, why do we care? Well, it means it means budget deficits in the range of out of a four point six billion dollar budget, four point five billion dollar budget, it means budget deficits in the range of one point seven to five to two point two billion dollars uh, next year. Next year, and going back to the forties, it means budget deficits start softening a little bit to one point seven five to one point five billion, but multi multi hundred million dollar billion dollar plus. Uh, budget deficits, as far as the eye can see. Well, it also well, and I would uh, just I would just say, and on top of that, just a reminder, uh, that means it, and we don't have a CBR to draw from anymore, and we can't overdraw the ERA, and so those are one point five billion dollar plus deficits going forward for the foreseeable future, with no other way to pay for them. Right. Uh, I mean, that's uh, there. There will be new revenues. It's a question of which type of new revenues. Uh, uh, that that we want. The other thing, Michael, is um, I- I- is the knock on effect on oil exploration of staying down in this price range. Uh, oil search is already deferred. Conoco has cut back uh, uh, has cut back on its activity. We don't know about Hillcorp because we don't know about Hillcorp's financials, and we don't know much about Hillcorp. Um, but but one would would reasonably expect they would they would cut back uh, as well as every other oil company uh, is doing. So we're, the knock on effect of of going down into this into this thirty dollar price range um, and and staying in this price regime for thirty and forty dollar price regime for an extended period that's going to have a huge impact I think on exploration activities and development activities up on the slope. I won't be surprised, especially given what oils, what's going on with oil search back in New Guinea, in, in, with their LNG project back in New Guinea. Uh, I won't be surprised to see oil search essentially go into cold mode uh, for an extended period of time. They've already essentially done that um, and continue to stay in that mode as long as we're in a thirty to forty dollar uh, price regime. I won't be surprised to see Conoco continue to to soften their investment on the North Slope. So that means. Uh, some of this production increase that we're counting on toward the end of the 10-year period, uh, the end of this coming decade, uh, to come online with PICA and with and with the, the stuff that Conoco is doing and with the step-ups that Hillcourt might be making, this, this production surge we're counting on at the end of the decade to sort of give us a stability then uh, may, be, uh, may be in jeopardy. Uh, probably is in jeopardy, and that means the outlook, the revenue outlook in those in those outlook years, in those out years, um, is is even worse than uh, than we're saying right now. So there's there's really nothing good that comes out of this, clearly, but we have to realize that. I mean, we right. we can't just keep putting our heads in the sand and say, oh, we can cut our way out of this, or production will get our or will get us out of this, or prices will recover and we'll get out of this. There the, there is no cavalry coming over the hill we need to face up to that and and the consequences of that uh, of what that means for uh, alaska fiscal policy and the alaska economy in general brad we're running out of time i do want to get to number three quickly but we only have about 90 seconds here the question is will the governor veto this budget will he take a look at it so give us the short answer and then we can expand on it in the break but uh, what are your thoughts yeah, I don't think the governor vetoes the entire budget as some of, as some have asked him to do. As that's that to me is reckless, and I can explain why uh, in the break. I do think the governor vetoes some items. The legislature increased uh, the university uh, allocation over and above the the agreement reached between the governor and the board of regents. I think the governor vetoes it back at least to that. Um, uh, and there are other places. I mean, he, the the legislature restored some for the Southeast Ferry System. I think the governor vetoes some of that. I think there are places the governor will veto it down. Uh, maybe, maybe at the at the outside, a uh, hundred million dollars. Uh, that's going to be stretching it. Uh, but I don't think he he comes in and says, "I'm just going to veto the entire budget." And by the way, everybody, you go back to Juneau or go to Wasilla or go to, you know, collect again in violation of our of our COVID nineteen order. Uh, collecting and I, I just don't I don't see him doing that. I am curious uh, as to whether or not he has any mechanism through the emergency powers 
to be able to find some way to supplement Alaskans or give them a stimulus of some kind or find some other way to end run around the legislature. But you seem to think that Bert has got this pretty much all sewed up at this point. Uh, I have I've had this emergency powers debate uh, uh, elsewhere uh, in the same statute that gives him the emergency powers. There's a statute that says uh, any commitment by him over a million dollars has to be uh, ratified by the legislature in some fashion. Uh, I don't see the legislature doing that. So uh, the governor does have some emergency powers. Uh, the legislature, frankly, has given him some more in uh, in the bill they passed uh, in the last hours of the legislature. But none of those include the power to commit uh, huge amounts of additional money without without legislative confirmation. And I just don't see the legislature doing that. Uh, so very limited vetoes potentially from the governor. I mean, I, I agree with you. I would be surprised if he does it based on his reaction so far. I have not been, <clears throat> you know, his response to the COVID thing has been phenomenal, and I appreciate that. But I have not been impressed uh, with uh, somebody said with Governor Stevens at the helm the other day. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, but it it kind of along that lines. Um, but well, well, but but he's trapped, Michael. I mean, he doesn't yeah. have a majority. There isn't a majority in either body. Yep. Uh, of fiscal conservatives. And and as Bert demonstrated, when you've got the majority in both bodies, you can do some really spectacularly devilish things. Um, and the governor doesn't have uh, enough allies in either body to be able to blunt that. Right. Brad Keithley, thank you, my friend. Interesting discussion as always. Stay safe, enjoy the music, and we will uh, we'll check in with you again uh, next week. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.